today, <laughs> like I do ever, right? I want to be able to let God speak. That's what we are called to do. We are called to let God take charge. When it comes to Scripture, when it comes to our lives, when it comes to everything we do, God wants us to be His. Simply put, we are in a situation this day and age where people don't want to continue preaching and teaching the Word. A lot of people are scared of what might happen if we go and preach and teach the Word. I don't want that for you or for anyone else. I want to be able to assure you that God is with us and we need to be firmly rooted in God's Word today for, and tomorrow and throughout until we go to be with Him. And so that our children and our children's children can continue praising His name and lifting up His name and His Word. Because, folks, like we talked about last month, we went through Restoration Month last month, where we talked about the history of the Restoration Movement and talked about all the details and all the slogans and everything that that entailed and how biblically those are centered in God's Word. And I said we need to be people of the book. Boy, do we ever need to be people of the book today. In fact, that is why I'm continuing on a little bit with that today, kind of leading into what we're going to be talking about today. Because today in our society, we have a problem letting God have a part in anything. Now, whether it's, you know, it's bigger than government. I think there's a lot of people who think, well, you're not, you know, they don't let God in government and all that. Well, it's more than just God in government. It's God in anything. God in any principle whatsoever, even God in preaching, has taken a back seat. People are wanting to say, well, this is how it's done. I don't want to do it how it's done by some modern guys. I want to do it just like Peter did, just like Paul did, just like those guys that you read about in the Scripture. They didn't hold back. They got those verses straight from Scripture, and they started preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because they were eyewitness to it. I've been witness to what Jesus Christ has done for me. Look at my life. I know how bad it can get. And I've seen how bad it can get. I've gotten to the bottom of the barrel. But Jesus pulled me out of that. And it takes us being willing to say, what do I need to do? In Psalms 1830. Psalms 1830 is going to be the main verse today. I'll give you the other parts here in just a minute. But in Psalms 1830, it reads, As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Isn't it amazing what God is capable of doing if we continue to stay with him? There's three points to this. But I want to go and say exactly what the whole principle is that we're talking about this morning. Not me, but he. Let me repeat that. Not me, but he. Now, teachers, I know it's probably not numerically correct to say it quite like that. But in all essence, I will tell you this right now. It isn't about what I want. It isn't about how I want it. It isn't about how I want to be saved. It isn't about how I want to be preached. It isn't about how things need to be according to Robbie Harmon. It is how things need to be according to God. Period. There doesn't need to be any more saved than what God says. Forget about what other people are saying. Forget about what preachers are saying. Forget about those things. Let's see what God has to say about it. I had a discussion with a fellow online yesterday. You can call it a discussion. All he did was throw 10 or 12 pictures at me and told me that I needed to grow up as far as my faith goes. While going and shooting stuff, shooting his argument in the book with straw men and all those other ideas and principles that these guys who don't believe in the Bible use. I look at him and I say, guys, I love you. And I want to encourage you and I want to pray for you. And they come back with, well, that's a whole lot of nothing being done, making yourself feel good. No, it isn't about making me feel good. It's about allowing God to know that there's a heart out there that needs to be heard. And there is a need there. Folks, the gospel is in need of being proclaimed. 
And we have to be the ones that are doing it. Not just the preachers, not just elders, not just deacons, and not just people that have got a lot of excitement in their hearts and want to share the good news. Every single person needs to share the good news of Jesus Christ now more than ever. If we believe and trust in Jesus Christ, why are we doing something about it? Why aren't we doing anything about it? I have so many people that ask me, why is the church silent? Why is it quiet when it comes to so much going on in this world? And I said, I think we're a little scared. I think it's a little bit of everything. I think they're a little scared. And I think there's a lot of it that folks just don't know the scripture. And we want to be able to help them know the scripture. That's why when I start preaching from here out, it's not going to be going and saying, okay, well, let's see what this, what this guy thinks and what that guy thinks. <laughs> no. We're going to go and see what Scripture says. We're going to see what Scripture says about it directly. We're going to talk about what God wants. Now, I know I've done that in the past, but now the blinders are off, the harness is off. It's time to go wild <laughs> because the only harness I'm going to have is God's Word. That's the only thing I'm going to go on. And that's the only thing we should go on. Why do I say that? Not my word, but his. That's why. Not my word, but his. Because God's word's where it's at. I've got guys that are all over the place when it comes to scripture. They'll go and they'll pick something out here and pick something there and pick something there and throw this out and throw that out because I don't need that. That's, that's, that that'll offend somebody. That'll hurt somebody's feelings. We have wrong, the wrong definition of what love is. <laughs> love is what Jesus did. Now, a lot of people look at that and say, yeah, he loved us enough that he died on the cross for us. Oh, no, no. More than that. He loved us enough to tell us the truth and not to be ashamed of that truth. He said, guys, I'm here to help the lost. We need Jesus to show us the truth. Romans 1, 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, what does that mean? It's simple. Paul ain't afraid. Paul ain't scared. Paul ain't going to back down because somebody said, Well, I'm offended. I don't want to believe in that. Forget that. Because if we've got God on our side, we don't have to worry. If we've got God's word behind us, we don't have to worry. If we've got God living in us, if we've got God alive in us, and if we're preaching and proclaiming the gospel as it is written right there, then we don't have a fear to worry about. We don't have one thing that can hold us back except ourselves. And that's what we do. We go and we pull ourselves. We kind of hold ourselves back because we're afraid we might say something wrong or we might do something wrong. Oh, what about tell somebody wrong? That's why we study. That's why we get involved in the scripture. That's why we talk to one another. That's why we have Bible study. That's why we do all these things. It's because we want to be ready. It's why we have Sunday school in the morning. Sunday school is important. And it's not important just because, well, Robbie said we need to be in Sunday school. No, I say we need to be in Sunday school because we need to be studying. We don't need to be thinking, well, I can get away with that. I've got, I know enough Bible to be dangerous. No, I don't know enough Bible. I don't know enough Bible. I want to know more. And the only way I'm going to get to know more is if I actually go and study what God's Word says. That's the only way I'm going to know more. And that's why it says in Romans 10, 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. I don't hear, excuse me. That's why it says in Romans 10, 17, so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of Christ. Hearing by the Word of Christ. That means I've got to be able to get studied so that I can communicate to you guys and to the rest of people that are out there wanting to hear the good news. That means we have to be ready and be prepared to study the Word and teach the Word. What's stopping us? Ourselves. That's it. It's the only thing that can stop us because we're trusting more in ourselves than God. Don't trust in ourselves. Trust in what God's capable of doing. When you take off the blinders and say, God, you lead the way. When you do that, you let God lead the way. You let God go and work in you. And you let God do these things and introduce you to his word, his way, his will. Things happen. People change. You change. My wife told me the other day. In the last couple of months, I've seen a big difference in you. 
I said, why? Is it because I shaved the mustache? She said, no. She said, I haven't seen you study this much in forever. And I said, I need to because I am not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. And I'm not doing it for everybody. I'm not doing it for me alone. I'm doing it for God because I want to get to know God. God is not some invisible fake friend that's out there. God is real, and God is there for us, and he wants to have a relationship with us. But where do we start with that relationship? Well, first thing, we have to believe. We have to believe that what we're reading is true here. Just as I said, how are people going to believe that word unless they actually hear that word? And so we have to go not my way to get to heaven, not my way to get to know God, but his way. Not my way, but his not my way, but his. Hebrews 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Verse 6 goes on to say, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You notice there's an active part there. This is not something we just sit and think it's going to come to us in time. No, it means we got to get up and do something about it. That's what faith is. Faith is getting up and being active. Faith is getting up out of our seats and coming out of our comfort zone. I'm not comfortable being up in front of people. People say, well, you do, you do pretty good at that preaching thing. You talk quite a bit. You present things and, and you go and you teach classes and you do this and you do that. If it was me doing it, no, I could not do it. I'd be scared to death. I'd be hiding behind this thing. But that's what God does. That's what God can do. God's put it into our hearts to be able to do what we normally can't. But that he can do. But we've got to trust him. And the first thing we've got to do is trust his way. And that means, first off, we have to believe in him and trust in him and have faith in him. Take those first steps out. And then you got to repent. Luke 13, 3 says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3 says that. You want to write that verse down too. That's a big one. In fact, if you want to write that verse down, I'll give you another verse to write down too. Go right along with it. Verse Verse Luke, Luke verse, or Luke 13, verse 5. Luke 13, 5. If you want to write that one down, you'll notice something. It's the same as the third verse. It is exactly the same as the third verse. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you sense Jesus is trying to tell people something here? Do you sense that Jesus is trying to say something here? That is something that's not being preached in the pulpit at all these days. Now, I'm not saying that in general. I'm not saying that about some of the guys around here locally. I'm not saying that about folks in the state of Kentucky generally. Most preachers are going to read God's word and be true to it. However, there is a growing movement in this country and outside this country to preach what feels good or worse what is completely against what God's word says. And they'll go and say, oh, you come to Jesus on your terms and you can believe in him and he'll accept you just the way you are because you were born that way. Let me be the first to tell people, no, you are not born that way. The thing you're born in is sin and it's something you've got to get rid of. How do you get rid of it? Not through me, not through my way, not through prayer, but through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, by believing in him and giving yourself up to him to repent. That is something that is sorely missing in our churches today. Repentance. When are we going to get over ourselves and say, I have sinned? Folks, I can tell you right now, if the guy was standing in here that I was when I was 26 years old preaching this, I wouldn't blame God one bit if he struck me dead. Because that God 
knows who I was at 26 years old, knew my heart at 26 years old, and it was not right with him. But if I come in here at 26 years old and told you what these guys were saying here in pulpits around the world today, I'm telling you right now, I should be struck dead. Because I'm telling you, you have to change. God commands it. Not me. God. God himself. Jesus Christ. If you believe Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, then you believe these words right here. These are his words. Twice in the same area, the same paragraph, the same conversation. He says, if you do not repent, you will surely perish. That's not me, that's Jesus. And if you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God, you've got to understand what sin is. And you've got to understand that you can't run away from sin until the day you die. Because that day will come and it'll catch you. You've got to be willing to make the change now. But what about confessing? Isn't confessing important? Yes, it is. It's highly important. Confessing Jesus before men is important. He says that in Matthew 10, 32 and 33. He says, therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who's in heaven. How are you going to trust in God's will and God's way if you ain't willing to go and meet him on his terms? you got to be willing to confess Jesus Christ. People today are afraid to confess Jesus Christ. They're afraid they might be penalized or looked at differently. I don't care who knows it. I am a Christian first and only. And I'm proud to call myself of Christ. And I'm proud to call him not just my Savior, but my Lord. That's what it takes. You see, he's not just your Savior, folks. He's your Lord. He's your creator. He is your friend, yes. But he is also the one who is Lord of your life. When you go and you believe, repent, and confess his name, you're not going and saying, okay, that's it. That's all I want to do. And, and I'll take the rest of my life, thank you very much. He's saying, no. You've got to change. You've got to be changed. For you all are sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed yourself, have clothed yourself with Christ. Well, what am I talking about there? That's what happens after you confess him. you got to be baptized. Why? Not my way. His way. It's not my way. I can't tell you to go and do whatever. I can't. I can't tell you to pray this prayer. I can't do that because it's not in here. Pray this simple prayer. No, that's not what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. You've got to be able to understand and believe who Jesus Christ is. How can you go and, and believe in Jesus Christ and say you believe in Jesus Christ when you're not even living for Jesus Christ? And prayer is a work. i got bad news for you. Prayer is a work, a man-made work. Well, so is baptism. No, it isn't. Read on. 1 Peter 3.21 Baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clean conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You want a cross-reference with that? Cross-reference Colossians 2.12. Colossians 2.12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God. Let me repeat that in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God. Baptism is not my work. It's not the preacher's work. It's not the individual's work. It's God's work. That is God hands-on. That is where you meet the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit right there. As Don DeWell called it back in the good old days, he said that is a tomb and a womb all in one. 
And I agree with that 100%. That is where the old man dies. That is where the new man is raised. And that is how we are transformed. Not by my work, not by your work, not by my way, but God's way. That's what God's word says. And with doing that, it's not my will being done, but God's will being done. His will, not my will, His will. That's the last part of this. And it is one of the most essential parts of it. And the reason I say that is because we seem to think that it's a 50-yard dash to get somebody up here to the baptistry, dip them in some water, raise them up in the newness of life, and everybody thinks, that's the finish line. It's over. It's done. The race is ended. They're all good. They're going to heaven. And we're going to raise God for that. No. That's the starting point. That's not the finish line. That's the starting point. That's where he's on the market set. Boom, go. When you come up out of, newness, out of the water, you come up in the newness of life. That's the starter gun going off and him saying, go. That's Matthew 28, 19 and 20 right there. Go. Therefore, go. Get out. Tell them the good news. Baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Get out. Do your thing. Get out and do his thing. Why his thing? Because it's not my will, it's not my way, it's not my word, it's his. Philippians 3.12 reads it very clearly. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I have not already obtained perfection. I'm not already there. I haven't won the race yet. This isn't a 50-yard dash. This is a marathon. Christianity, the Christian life, is a marathon, and it starts there. And that means when you come up out of that water and you come out the newness of life, you start and get your running shoes on, and you go, baby, go. Now, we're not all going to come out of that water the same way. We're all going to mature a little differently. And that's why we're here for each other. That's why we encourage each other. That's why we run the race together. That's why I tell folks, don't be, don't be afraid to assemble together with those of like precious faith. Don't give me that excuse that I can go out in the woods and talk to God just as good as anybody. Don't give me that excuse. That excuse is laid thin and bare by what God's word says. God's word says what? If you are going to go and forsake the assembling together, you got a problem. Because Hebrews 10.25. I don't even have to read it. You go and look it up. Hebrews 10, 25. It's not what I say. It's what God's word says. It's what God wills for his people. God wills for his people to come together. And we should take that seriously. And if you're on vacation, what should you do? Go find you a place to come together. Whether you're, whether you're with your family. If you're with your family and you can't find a, a, a place where they preach the gospel truth, you come together with your family, you break bread, you take the cup, and you spend time together, and you worship together. But I also say if you can find a place that teaches the gospel and preaches the gospel and partakes of the word, of the word and the Lord's Supper, do it. Get out there. Do it. Be a part of that. Spend time with your brothers and sisters in Christ and grow. Stretch those wings. And don't be afraid. Paul wasn't. In fact, in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, he was getting ready to die. And he says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, And the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which is which the Lord, the righteous judge, award, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearance. That's trusting in God's will. That's trusting in God's will right there. Why? Because look at what he's saying to do. Keep running the race. I'm almost done with the race now. I can tell you that's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm almost done with this race. They're going to put me to death. And when they put me to death, Father, I can't wait because that means I'm going to see you face to face. And, our, and your will will be fulfilled through me. Why are we being more like him? 
Why ain't we being more like Jesus? What did Jesus do when he was afraid? What did he do when he was afraid? Was afraid that something bad would happen. Luke 22, 42. If you want to look it up. Luke 4, 22, 42. He was praying to God at that point and saying, Lord, I know what's coming. He knew what was coming for him the next day. We don't have a clue what's happening the next day. Our freedoms, our lives may be changed and turned upside down. We never know. But Jesus gives us the recipe. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. What are we doing? We're trusting in ourselves way too much. We think we've got it all together. We are in the heart of a beautiful country where people believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. No, we're not. The foundations are starting to crack. American Christianity is starting to look a lot like idolatry and self-worship. It's time for us to become Christians again. Because Matthew 7, 21 is probably the scariest warning to any of us. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. Not my will, but his be done. His will. He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Those people will enter the kingdom of God. Now, you all get what I'm saying? Do you get what God's word is saying here? You don't have to listen to me. I'll be glad to give you those verses too. We'll, I'll, I'll share those verses with you. I've got a handout to give you to share that talks about what we just talked about this morning. I'll do whatever I can to help you see what this Bible says and not what I say because it has absolutely nothing to do with what Robbie Harmon says. It has absolutely nothing to do with Rob, what Robbie Harmon says. It has everything to do with what God says and what God knows. That's what wins souls. That's what changes lives. Let God change you. 